Hi, everyone. This is Matt with ESI Survival Guide. We are an online resource to help legal professionals navigate the electronic wilderness. And today, I'm thrilled to have David Horrigan uh, as our guest on the guide. Welcome, David. How are you? Matt, I am pleased to be here. Uh, happy Thanksgiving Eve to you. I know our viewers will be seeing this later, but Matt and I are getting together on the day before Thanksgiving. And um, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Secondly, thank you for the rela relaxed atmosphere. I uh, sent Matt an email this morning. Like, <laughs> By the way, I guess I should have asked, this is an audio podcast, right? We're not on video, i.e. no business attire needed. And Matt's like, well, no, actually it is video. I'm like, well, I'll go change. He's like, no, man, it's cash. I'm like, all right. So I'll just See, leave the sweatshirt and the baseball cap on. And, and David, they, they always say, you know, dress for your guests. So if I could pan my camera around, I actually did bring out the three-piecer for this session just in case. But I, I'm, glad ah. I, I'm glad we were able to go, go a little bit casual. I thought Well, you as you can see here, uh, we're just being really casual with the golden retriever hanging on the <laughs> office floor. Gosh, the office is a mess. Sorry about that. But um, yes, um, Tucker, otherwise known as Jazzin's Goodwill of the Irish, <laughs> is um, hanging out here as we record. Very cool. Well, I, I like the relaxed vibe and, and we're in for a good conversation. We're going to do this in a little bit different format than we normally do uh, these discussions on the guide. We're going to break up our talk with David into four segments. When I, when I thought of it, I thought of it as kind of the man, the myth, the legend type of thing. <laughs> but we're going to talk about it in terms of, of uh, David, the lawyer, David, the technologist, David, the orator, and David, the individual. And we're, we're going to front load our discussion with a term uh, I've heard you use many times, David, uh, whether you coined it or not, I'm not sure, but, but it sounds like something you would have coined, some substantive fun, but substantive about yeah. you. So we're going to jump into you as an individual here a little bit. And before we start, let me just give the obligatory disclaimer of the opinions, comments, and views that we express on this podcast are those of each of us alone and not those of our respective organizations or our friends or our family. And nothing on this session is to be construed as legal advice. If you have a legal issue, uh, consult your attorney. And with that, David, I would like to just jump right in. I like your disclaimer, Matt. I, you know, when I moderate a session, I'll usually say, please consider this friendly advice, not legal advice. <laughs> sure, definitely. And to the extent it sounds like legal advice, it is not. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I, and we'll talk about this in the order section. You, your buddy of mine got this GPS, and I think it was, you could convert the directions to Samuel L. Jackson, Jackson's voice or Joe Pesci's voice. And I, you I was, almost made me projectile <laughs> this uh, Gatorade. Go Gators. For those of you who don't know, Gatorade invented at the University of Florida. Yes, true. See? See? See, see, we're not all just about legal technology. You get a lot of good, good trivia. Um, but well, but you're I, kind I, on the voice. By the way, my I recommend this microphone highly. It helps. But uh, people have been kind and said, "Wow, I love your voice. It's got yeah, the great, great moderated voice, radio voice." But my dad has a much better voice. I think my voice is a little bit high pitched. I actually wish my voice could go down an octave. And here we have <laughs> Matt Knopf here with us. Um, but my dad. Um, he is a naval officer who's in mission control at NASA um, oh, wow. back during Apollo Skylab and the shuttle and all that. And uh, he has the best voice. It's like you're at a legal tech conference and the voice of God comes over the speaker when the speakers go. <laughs> oh, I want to come back to that. That's that's amazing. My, my, my dad was was military, uh, was an Air Force colonel, but I imagine growing up with with a dad, it, that was in NASA. Must have been we are living parallel lives because my dad uh, was a Navy captain. Same thing as uh, your Colonel dad. Um, yeah, wow. Good. It was crazy because when I was in law school, um, we were sitting there having lunch one day, first year of law school. I just met this guy and um, he mentions, it's like, oh yeah, my, I, I said, my dad was an aerospace physiologist for NASA. It's like, that's funny. My dad was a flight physiologist for the Navy. And there just aren't many of them. Like my dad was, 
naval officer flight physiologist number 16. Sure. Um, now my dad's been around for a few years. Well, long story short, it turns out that his stepdad and my dad had known each other for 25 years. Oh, wow. And it's just happenstance. We both ended up at the University of Florida Love and College of Law. Go Gators. Sure, sure. It's a small world. But I guess they have like the launch site and NASA's down there a bunch too. So I guess if you, if you were going to going to give the odds on two two folks like that meeting florida wouldn't be a wouldn't be the worst place right no but it was just a complete coincidence sure. um that you know because i've had a long attachment to florida because my mother's from there it's the old exactly. story if you meet some kid and and gender roles have changed since our parents times but ordinarily it was like you meet some kid whose dad is a naval aviator uh, naval aviator nine times out of ten mom's from pensacola florida Sure, sure. And I, I love that. And, and I definitely want to talk more about your childhood and your dad, especially your dad in, in that role, especially now too. I, I, think, I think it was, if not today, maybe yesterday, I just tweeted about it. That, um, and I don't know why this isn't bigger news, that, that Elon Musk, that they're launching in collaboration with NASA, a program, a, a defensive program to deal with errant problematic asteroids. Did you see this? The, the... Yeah, I, I I didn't read it, but I saw the headline. <laughs> yeah, so <clears throat> they I mean, could it, save humanity. Exactly. It, it, you know, it, it's. I think I saw that right next to like a, a funny cat tweet. So it's just amazing <laughs> the priorities that we've gotten as a society. Yeah. But, but um, definitely want to revisit that. But first, David, for um the viewers out there who may not be familiar with you, which again, maybe I'm speaking to to you, to one of you out there, because if you're in the e-discovery industry and you're not familiar with David, you might want to get a computer <laughs> to, to maybe uh, <laughs> tr try and uh, up the game a little bit. But but David, you serve in your current role at Relativity as Discovery Council and Legal Education Director. And you've had an, a, a very storied past in terms of your career. I was talking to Maribel Rivera about how People come to the e-discovery industry through myriad ways, each as unique as the next. But your path, there's there seems to be some consistency to it. There's also a lot of, of, of nuances in it that, that I want to talk about. But before I, I jump into that, let's talk a little bit just about, about how you're doing. Are, are you still, uh, I know you're in the home office, and I know that you're remote by design. When you joined right. Relativity, if I'm not mistaken, you could have gone to Chicago, but you stayed in Boston. Am I correct in saying that? Right. Yeah. It would have been difficult for me because, I mean, I've got kids and uh, my wife works for the Commonwealth. And so it'd be, it'd be tough for her to move. Um, she may, basically, she'd lose her job. <clears throat> so Relativity, Kikira at the time, was very kind and um, let me stay in Boston. Uh, and because I have been working with Relativity now for, gosh, time flies, um, over a decade. and. Wow coming up on seven years as an employee because, you know, industry analysts are in, in, and frankly, I don't, a lot of people, I don't think know what industry analysts do. I mean, they're used to hearing on the news and Jonathan Smith, a textiles analyst with Smith Barney said, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I just made up that person to my knowledge. He does not exist. But um, the industry analysts in e-discovery had historically been tech people and I guess is 12 years ago, 451 Research said, well, why don't we hire a lawyer to be the e-discovery analyst? And so they wanted somebody who could write. And I got lucky and the headhunter found me because um, I had not only been a lawyer, but been a journalist, a, a um, writer at the National Law Journal and uh, for legal tech news for many years. And so that's what they kind of wanted to find, a lawyer who could write. And, you know, we as lawyers write all the time, but um, we lawyers aren't the best writers in the world. And um, so they were looking for someone who they thought could write would be a lawyer. And it was really novel. 451 Research did that first. And then so as no they say- pun, no pun intended, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, but it's, you know, they say that uh, copying is the most sincere part of uh, flattery. Um, I think I've butchered that quote, but we all know what I meant. Um, now people have followed in that IDC has had two great lawyers in a row. They had Sean Pike as their e-discovery analyst. And now they've got Ryan O'Leary as the e-discovery analyst. And so uh, there was another um, gentleman in Boston, Blue Hill. Uh, but I, I got to meet this guy because I've never met him. Um, his name is Houlihan. And um, he apparently enjoys gins and tonic. And people are like, God, this guy is your clone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, so the, this idea of getting lawyers as, as e-discovery analysts um, really caught on. 
Well, well, you you were counsel at, at the Entertainment Software Association. So when you went to 451 Research and began working more in, in the analyst slash journalist kind of arena, was that a big jump? I mean, oh, it was a huge change. And you know, you hear people talk about spouses of people in the military, like, oh, gee, their careers change. Um, but twice my career has been dictated by my significant other. Um, after law school graduation, my girlfriend and I were deciding where we wanted to live and she got a position with the legal department of the United Nations. And so it's like, well, it looks like we're going to New York. Sure. And, um, you know, I got up there and um, was interviewing for jobs and I had done a lot of writing before going to law school. And so the National Law Journal had um, an opening for a legal reporter. And I'm like, wow, this is great. And I sent them some of my research and stuff that I'd written. And so we get down to this interview process. And um, I've so I get this offer from the National Law Journal. And like my girlfriend's at the United Nations, I'm at the Law National Law Journal, and I'm like, wow, top of the world. Go in the next morning to talk salary. I have never been more candid about money in a job interview in my life. I'm sitting there and I just I'm like how do you get lawyers to work for this kind of money? <laughs> and uh, the, the editor, also a lawyer, sat back and chuckled and was like, I'm dating myself now, but um, the fax machine runs all night long every time we have an opening. And sure enough, and while I was there, um, every time we had an opening fax machine of all these lawyers who are sick of being lawyers, and tired of practicing who wanted to do something. And, um, you know, I, I went straight to the National Law Journal right out of law school. And so I was studying for the bar and boy, was that great preparation because I was what ALM called the 50 States Project. Okay. It was where they had some of us who were covering all the court decisions all across America. So basically I read court decisions all day long and then wrote about them. <laughs> what better preparation for the bar exam is that? Or, or what, what better way to make you never want to read another word or write another word ever again? Yeah, I suppose <laughs> I'm kind of geeky. I just love the stories. I used, I did it when I was in grad school too. And um, at the, I, I considered, I was really lucky because if you were a um, person who was not yet a lawyer and especially a grad student, not even a law student, a student in graduate school, I mean, you're usually not even doing the thinking e-discovery that we've all done in document reviews. You're talking putting tabs and folders and that kind of stuff. Sure, sure, so sure. like reading legal opinions, man, that's <laughs> great stuff. Well, it makes a lot of sense too, because one of the things we'll talk about, we'll get into some substantive aspects of, of some of the, the blog posts that you've done for Relativity uh, over the past year, is one of the things that I, I've, I've always really admired about your writing is the way that you can turn, I mean, by their very nature, law cases are, are stories, right? There's an underlying set of facts that's crafted in a story. Not always the most interesting, but you always find a way to, to craft this narrative that involves not only really getting to the, the nuts and bolts and, and the meat of a story, but also swirling in these outside elements too that make it more interesting. You're, you're, again, like your celebrity sushi blog is one that stands out for me. Um, you know, and, and again, I guess that makes me a nerd too. I don't know how many people memorize blog entries from the industry. Oh, uh, you you are kind. And, and first of all, that 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 uh, that is a, such a wonderful thing to hear on Thanksgiving Eve, um, because that is one of my biggest goals in life. I am a big subscriber to the philosophy of to entertain is to educate. And, you know, the work at the National Law Journal, before I was actually reporting on feature stories and that sort of thing, on the 50 States Project, that was basically reporting what the court did. None of my case law coverage is like that because I, I want to tell a story. And uh, I told this lawyer years ago, yep, when I write about it, I want to make e-discovery entertaining. And this lawyer just cracks up laughing. You're going to make e-discovery entertaining. I'm like, that's my goal. And so when I write an article, um, I by no means uh, is a large percentage of that from the case. I go back and I research the case, uh, the, the fact pattern that happened before the case to get some interesting things. Um, viewers, if you're wondering about celebrity sushi, this is a case that happened in California. It involved 
I will dispute where they had an ad terrorum clause. For those of you on the tech side may not care about the Latin, an ad terrorum clause is basically a no contest clause in a will. You can't contest the will or you lose everything. Uh, courts disfavor that highly. So this is a big fight over this. Well, this celebrity woman um, donated, uh, she, her, her kid got a couple of million bucks. So like, who's mad about getting a couple of million bucks? <laughs> Well, when it's going to the dogs, you are. So the, the woman gave the bulk of her estate to a pet foundation she had started. So this guy stuck with his two million bucks and then uh, the dogs get everything. And, you know, hey, Tucker, nothing wrong with that, right? So what in the heck? Oh, I was about to curse on Matt's Airways. What in the heck does this have to do with celebrity sushi? Which is the, the story for rediscovery was sanctioned. That kind of podcast. Yeah. So the lawyer is getting sanctioned by the court. And as they said, her appellate brief was riddled with so many expletives, it made the court blush. Um, so they're sanctioning her. And this, the, to give you an insight into the lawyer's character or uh, volatility, shall we say, <laughs> she apparently got into a fight with Sharon Osbourne in a sushi restaurant because there were allegations of cheating at a Sharon Osbourne charity giveaway. I mean, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, but see, here's the deal. This is why to entertain is to educate. Matt remembers that case. If well, I just said, well, there were sanctions for profanities in the appellate brief. Nobody's gonna remember that. A sushi fight with Sharon Osbourne? Yeah. You're going to remember that. Well, plus, I'm a, I'm a Black Sabbath fan. I mean, you can see some of the guitars. <laughs> Ozzy! The but, I mean, that, that, it, but that was the thing. The, the funny thing was, was the cheating allegation. You would assume it'd be at maybe backstage or at some music event. <laughs> that's a charity giveaway, which no. makes it even more hilarious. But no, but David, the thing that's great is that, you know, you combine those elements in a way that's not distracting. To be honest, I mean, you see a lot of folks who try that technique and it ends up being distracting or going going on tangents i i've, I've been a culprit of doing that so i think that um you're definitely like probably the, the the goat in terms of of telling e-discovery stories in a way that uh makes them sticky uh and, and i would say entertaining so i appreciate thanks so in the spirit of thanksgiving thank you for that so <laughs> well thank you for your kind words my friend and going back so undergrad in texas Law school. Right. And actually, most of it at Tulane in New Orleans, a right, great place right. to go to school, roll wave. Sure, and sure. then part of a part of undergrad and grad school at the University of Houston, go Cougs, both both the University of Florida and the University of Houston are in the top 25 in college basketball right now. Um, the Tulane Green Wave, well, not so much, but roll wave nonetheless. I'm a Tar Heel. We had a close game with Brown University. So I <laughs> oh, no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> By the way, I used to work with the general counsel's office at Brown. So I have a, I have a fondness with Brown. I don't mean to make fun of Brown, but you don't think of the ladies and gentlemen of Chapel Hill losing to Brown <laughs> no, in no. sports. My, my, my brother, Chris, actually runs the Facebook, uh, the UNC Tar Heel, it's, I guess, Facebook group for uh, the basketball team, um, but also went to Brown for his, his undergrad. So wow, and, then, cool. and then, you know, got his, uh, his uh, PhD at Chapel Hill. So, so now uh, let's add to that. So Tulane, Houston, law school in Florida, Bard in, in, in Washington, DC, living in yep. Boston, Kelly Twigger, our, our mutual friend did ask me to ask you to talk a little bit about your time in the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The reason I'm laughing is because um, Kelly is a great friend, as is Kenya Dixon. Um, another, as another, is, great, um, another great uh, case law storyteller, by the way. Yeah, Kenya Parrish Dixon. She's, she's amazing. And, um, and, and Ryan O'Leary of IDC, another lawyer. So we four lawyers sometimes get together and industry stuff, and we've spoken on panels together before. Well, it turns out that Kenya and I both were exchange students in the Netherlands. I went to Leiden. I want to say she went to Amsterdam. She may have gone to Utrecht, but anyway, we both went to school in the Netherlands. Well, apparently we had both told Kelly and Ryan this, but forgot that we had told them this. So Kenya and I both had said, yeah, well, we went to school in the Netherlands, you know, Amsterdam's great. Like, um, and so now it's a running joke where Kenya and I will both say, by the way, did we tell you that David and I went to school in the <laughs> Netherlands? So that is why the Twigster had you asked me that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kelly Twigger. 
<laughs> sure. But that geographic path and the underlying education and professional development that goes along with that, again, it's, it's very unique. And knowing, knowing that you have a, a bit of a, of a military past uh, also uh, adds some insight to that. But, but I want to talk a little bit before I jump into asking you what was the impetus behind going to relativity? There's this very interesting thing we spoke about, your dad being involved with NASA. What is the connection with, with Houston? Oh, because he was at Mission Control at NASA. And um, boy, he was there as an ex- at an exciting time. Um, he was in Mission Control and um, was there for Apollo, Skylab, and the shuttle. And we lived in a neighborhood right across the street from NASA. It's a wonderful neighborhood. It's called Nassau Bay. The problem is, I don't know who had the bright wait, idea. Wait, wait, wait. So, so the, the, the NASA, the, the folks were Na- NASA people congregate to live is called Nassau Bay. And that's like, exactly like, what I was about to say. Like and I don't know who had the bright idea of doing that because the, the, the whole <laughs> idea is it's Nassau Bay and the winding bucolic streets all have Caribbean names and... There, and so you, you get the whole Caribbean feel, but everybody just called it NASA Bay because that's legitimately what they thought it was. I imagine there was a lot of who's on first moments for people like, oh, I'm, I'm going over to Nassau. I'm like, no, NASA? Right. NASA? Yeah. No, wait, Na- NASA? NASA? Wait, I'm going to, to my house. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had, we had two astronauts who lived on our street. So the tour buses used to come all the time. My brothers and sisters and our friends and I, we would sit out there waving to the tour buses. And then you knew that sort of the heyday of Apollo was over when the tour buses stopped coming. I mean, and it's not even so much that the heyday of NASA was over or Apollo was over, but that space flight became so commonplace. Sure. And when there was the Apollo 1 tragedy and the shuttle tragedies that followed, I mean, people die in car wrecks every day. And and I don't want to make fun of people's phobias, but but many people are afraid of going in planes. Sure. I'm like, man, when I strap in that seat, I know that I've got a professionally trained pilot. And if something happens to him or her, there's a professionally trained co-pilot. There are crazy people on the roadways. You're much more in danger in a car than a plane. You're just this move away from a head-on collision. So it's yeah, Yeah, exactly. I I feel really safe on planes, but I don't want to disparage people who have those those fear of uh, plane flights. And the same thing goes for NASA. I I think NASA sometimes um, has gotten unfairly criticized. When I was a little kid. Um, they used to on the NASA tour um, because even then people start with "Gee, we're spending a lot of money on this." And they said the old line was it, at the time it was the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. It was split into HHS and the Department of Education. But uh, the NASA tour would tell everyone um, that HEW spent NASA's annual budget every ten days. <laughs> sure. <laughs> to put it in perspective. But so I think NASA's safety record has been amazing. And, and not only that, it's been amazing when we're putting people on propelled rockets to the, high, to the lowest bidder, government contracts coming in. And so, and, and you know, I'm biased. My dad's in the space program, but boy, talk about heroes who really have advanced civilization, advanced science. And um, who knows if Elon Musk doesn't shoot enough of those asteroids coming in, we may need another place to live. So rah, rah, NASA. It's, it's actually unfortunate because I, I grew up uh, as the son of an Air Force colonel. Uh, my dad had a, a little six-seater plane he used wow. to work on all the time. So I didn't fly commercial for many years of my life and uh, made it for some very hairy experiences. But I always really valued that. And of course, growing up during that time in, in the 80s into the 90s, my dad was my hero in, in seeing his medals. And, and still is, I'm sure. Oh, of course, of course. It, it, but, 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 but I hearken back to that time because I remember when he would be stationed somewhere, he wanted to keep us in schools in Piner. So he would move, live on a boat, uh, on a harbor by the base. And um, I used to you know, sneak into his bedroom and look through his old medals and his old Vietnam War nice. memorabilia. But I think a lot of that, and, and I hope it's coming back. And maybe th- if there's one benefit of the many benefits of the private incursion into space flight, it's, it's expanding and recreating that, that ethos, the magic of, of space flight for, for young folks. I know that, like you said, it, they, it became so commonplace that when, when space shuttles took off, it was a huge thing. I mean, even Florida oh, yeah. used to dress up and put put suits on to go on an airplane, right? And it was a big part of my life too, because I remember 
I forget what the exercise was, but I was doing one of these like public speaking seminars to learn how to be better at, at being in order. And there was an element of it where we had to go back and explore a moment in time that was most memorable to us. Like one of our first big memories. And for me, it was, it was challenger and seeing that, yeah. on, uh, that on, on national TV. I think I was in the, was I in the first grade when that happened, but, but um, it, it not, not to kind of go down that road because obviously this is a, a jovial Thanksgiving podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I think that the, the underlying thing is just bringing back that spirit of adventure of exploration of, of magic, if you will. And I think it's interesting to hear about your past w- with regards to that, because I, I wonder how much of you growing up around that kind of amazingness that, that, uh, that the stories that surrounded NASA and just how crazy of a time that must have been influenced who you are now and your storytelling ability and how you still find all this excitement and, you know, again, to use the word magic and some of the things that we do and what's many would say is a very kind of stodgy, dense industry. So. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I mean, I loved hearing the stories about your dad. I, I mean, um, like I said, kindred spirits. Um, my dad uh, is a Navy captain, your dad's an Army colonel. So, uh, and actually I was born on a Naval Air Station. It's kind of embarrassing because I am the first David Horrigan. I, I'm, I'm the, the third, but in reality, I'm the fourth. And my son, his legal name is the fourth, but he's really the fifth. It, gets complicated. Um, (laughs) But um, I'm the first one not to serve. So I feel sort of um, like I haven't accomplished enough by not having done that. But it's kind of funny because we're looking at, I I was in Dublin not too long ago. And by the way, here I am, PSA for the Dublin Tourist Bureau. If you find yourself in Dublin, you've got to go to the Immigration Museum telling the story of Irish immigration. It's fascinating. And they've got a genealogical library there. And it is one of my geeky things when I was a kid. I used to do genealogy. But I'm going through and I'm, I'm tracing all the David Horrigans to the original David Horrigan. And it's by his name, Convict. And I'm like, holy expletive, we're all <laughs> descendants of a criminal. And I say, I, I was saying um, to, the, to the librarian, I'm like, I have an aunt who is going to be, uh, she's going to be beside herself. She'll be in tears for days. And he's like, why? I said, because the first David Horgan was a convict. He's like, nay, nay. And I'm like, turns out that um, if they had convict in County Cork in the 1700s, or in, uh, going into the 1800s, they were in fact freedom fighters. Yeah. Um, you know, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist, but um, they were the ones fighting off the British. And th- see, this is the inner turmoil that I have because I'm like half Irish, one fourth English and one fourth French. Talk oh, about wow. three groups who've been fighting <laughs> over all the time. I, I, I need years of therapy to get over that. Well, I, I was, I was going to say that maybe, you know, convict, if you feel about the onion, it was like, you know, it was like uh, uh, some kind of Peter Pan type of scenario, but freedom fighters even even better. So yeah, so that's 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 awesome. But trying trying to find a good segue from from uh, Peter Pan slash freedom fighter to your path to relativity, <laughs> if, if that could be the clunkiest segue ever. What was... yeah, it was really from four fifty one because relativity uh, was a client of four fifty one, and and so oh, okay. you know we talked about industry analysts earlier. They also do a song and dance. And I mentioned Ryan O'Leary and, and you know, Greg Buckles has his own firm. Mike Heck sure. um, covers the industry at Gartner and, and all just overly ethical people. But you're, you're wearing and, two and, hats. And a shout out to Greg Buckles. Greg Buckles, we syndicate his blog on the ESI Survival Guide blog. Is he the funniest guy on the planet or what? Right. He right. he says stuff I wish I could say. <laughs> um, I love it. His blog is one of the best. And he also is in a very niche place where he talks about real kind of gritty industry you know he's in the trenches man he's in the trenches and 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 i always butcher his taglines so while we're sitting here i'm going to look it up because (laughs) it's really good one and and greg shout out to you we are doing infomercials for edj here but only (laughs) because greg is such an institution and um well worth reading And, and that makes sense now because i was wondering when you said that you had been with Relativity for 10 years, employed for seven. Those not, previous, not going, not yet quite seven, almost seven. But, but those previous years were as an analyst working with them. 
Um, right, right. And because it's, it's two hats. So you've got to be the independent industry analyst that covers the industry, but also most major companies pay for indie industry analysts to advise them. And in fact, when I had, when I went on to um, briefings, I did, I had to go back and look at my notes. So I'd be sure a to remember what was NDA non-disclosure agreement. Um, most legal people, I think would know that. And you know, it's kind of sad what happened to the NDA um, with all of the um, bad behavior going on that brought about, about the Me Too movement. Um, NDA became a dirty word. And before, you know, the NDA to us was like a comfort blanket. It's like, okay, we can speak freely. Everybody's under an NDA, so it's fine. But and now NDA has turned into a dirty word. But uh, the Greg Buckles eDiscovery Journal tagline is unfettered perspective without polished marketing fluff and murky best practices um and that is just so buckles <laughs> there we go i dig it but again jumping from being an analyst to then having this amazing title and one of the things i love about this industry is all the really cool titles yeah most companies well most companies don't have discovery council but a lot of companies don't have an education coordinator especially one that does the types of things that you do usually you would see that be a, a, a multivariate function of marketing and whatnot, but you have a very unique role. I, I, to, to be honest, I try to think, it, it escapes me to think of another individual who has a similar role to you. Um, you know, there well, used to be, I would, you know, I would say Phil Favreau at Driven and Tara Emery. I, well, not much so much Tara, because I think she does a lot of management functions as well. But Phil Favreau, boy, if there's an expert on e-discovery laws, Phil Favreau at Driven. And so his role is similar, but a couple of companies used to, Guidance Software used to have a whole team of me's. They had Patrick Burke, um, a yep. legend okay. in the industry. And speaking yes. of the Cardozo project, the e-discovery board on which Matt and I serve, Patrick was the one who started that. He yep. started the um, data law program at Cardozo. So a salute to counselor there, Patrick Burke, just a great guy. And it was, it's, it's one of these things where I'm going to, going off on a tangent on a second because they did it. And then Semantic, Dean Gonsowski and, and others were there at Semantic. But they went by the wayside. And when I came on board, you know, um, Nick Robertson first gave me a call. I'm like, yeah. And, you know, there, there were a few companies I would have left to make a move. And Relativity was one. And because I've, I've just always admired what they have done from an early age. And I guess I was one of the early adopters um, back in the old Kekura days. But um, yeah, it is a unique role. And I, being the former industry analyst, I do analyst relations in addition to the Discovery Council role, just keeping up um, and making sure that I'm up on all the latest new discovery law. It, it, I, he wasn't being trite or corny at all, but when I first came over, Andrew Sage just said, you know, your role is to allow us to give something back. We're gonna give back this education. We're gonna give all these free CLEs. Now, obviously, we hope that the people who attend our CLEs will be, might be interested in our software, sure. but it's, uh, it, it's almost more of a customer service thing because a lot of the people who attend our programs are already our customers, or in your case, one of our partners or somebody who already uses relativity. So it's sort of that whole thing about building community. Um, my colleagues, Steve Tanner and Tammy Yosasovic uh, do the, and, and many others do the relativity community where you just, it, it's sort of like Apple's so big now, it's not really a community anymore, but you know what I mean, sure. where there's almost this cult-like thing, like, yay, we're part of something really cool. And giving people free CLE is part of that thing to, hey, you know, let's be something really cool. And relativity really cultivated that community and it wasn't just a community of, hey, we're a lot of people who are coming together over this piece of technology. Relativity really did a great job, Andrew and Nick and you and everybody, a great job of, of creating an identity to that community that I think still exists today and is really kind of permeated into the whole legal profession in, in many regards. But, but I, I wonder too, um, and this could be me just being part of the e-discovery bubble, looking you know from the inside outwards, but I'm remiss to think of another industry that has such a gap between what the law or what the tech or what the actual industry is and the, the customers and the users of that in terms yeah. of, of education. 
and folks always say, you know, an educational sell is a really hard sell. And I wonder if the fact that there is such this massive educational community in the e-discovery realm is, is because of that, because there's such a, a, a steep uh, educational curve, steep learning curve to really understanding this stuff. And it's always changing. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that, now, now again, I, I, that could be being part of the bubble. I'm sure there's conferences about aviation and engineering and everything. But, but you know, as an individual consumer, it's rare that I'm I'm buying an air conditioner and I need to know the inner workings of the air conditioner. Right. Or if I if I buy a car, I have to be an expert mechanic. But if if you're a lawyer, because of the changes and the trends around changes in data and how people communicate, you all of a sudden have to know this huge domain of information that's right. constantly changing. And I, I wonder if, if both purposely and maybe almost unconsciously, that's the reason why all of these resources kind of emerged uh, in the e-discovery industry. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's necessary in a lot of ways. And it just goes, you can, ALM's trademark, legal tech. When you are combining two disciplines, it's sort of like a Reese's peanut butter cup people probably never intended for peanut butter and chocolate to go together. But if you're old <laughs> enough to see, remember the old commercials where somebody fell and the chocolate bar, oh, went into the peanut butter. Oh, <laughs> two great things that taste great together. And, and so that's the way you got to look at a discovery. But man, there are learning curves on both of those. <laughs> Lawyers don't know the tech. And a lot of times the tech people don't know the law. And like on the Relativity Fest judicial panel, that is one of the ways where I really try to make it interesting and interesting for everyone. Sure. It, it, it's, it's relatively easy to put on a good program where judges talk to lawyers about the law. The majority of the audience at Relativity Fest are not lawyers. And so if I'm gonna do an effective program, ah. I have to be able to communicate with the audience. That's a good point. I never really thought about it that way. Yeah. And, and so I think about it all the time and, and people are kind. I mean, a couple of people have written, well, this was so great. I didn't understand a word of it, but it was so <laughs> great. I'm like, I have failed. Yeah, that, that's a fail. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. You use the analogy of legal and tech, chocolate and peanut butter. I was going to think more of like tuna fish and orange juice. Well, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Well, but, there is that. But fair enough. But so, so, um, you know, and, and last question about about your CV, essentially, before we move into my kind of James Lipton style uh, uh, questions. Um, but so, was your role at Relativity? Andrew had a vision for it, and you were the right candidate, or they they knew they had to have you to, as part of a team, and this kind of built around you i imagine this role has evolved over time well they and, and they were kind enough to create the role for me and it was um shortly after iconics investment in relativity and so this is going to sound so super superficial but it's like okay we got a bunch of cash let's go buy ourselves an industry analyst lawyer and <laughs> i i don't think it it was that but um they they were kind enough to tailor a role for me because they thought it would be helpful and my biggest fear when making that move, you know, it, it, I would be a two time sellout in some people's mind. When you make the leap from being a journalist to an industry analyst, they think you've sold out once. And then the, the big sellout is when you leave an, a research analyst firm to go to work for one of your customers, then you've really made the sellout. And a lot of the reasons they say that is because each one of those steps, you're making more money. Um, sure. But remember back to the National Law Journal story. What? How can you live in New York City on this? But we got by. Rodeo Bar had cheap beer. <laughs> yeah. um, well, law, for, law firm to vendor is another one of those ones. That's yeah, little, exactly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Look at sideways. Now, not so much anymore because now the whole notion of service providers in a pejorative way, which has traditionally kind of been some of the approach folks have taken, is changing rapidly. If anything, people are now realizing that in a sense, we're all doing business development, whether you're a partner at a law firm oh, yeah. or a business development person at a vendor, or uh, you're working for a-, a No, it's, it's a great point. And, and I always, I like to always reassure the, the, our sales team that I realize they're the ones who keep the lights on. And every, if you represent your company, you're a salesperson. I mean, you are representing the product or the service, whatever is going on out there. 
but I am big on the separation of church and state as far as our educational programming goes, because the number one complaint you will get is if what's supposed to be a CLE sounds like a sales pitch. And not only that, we have a we have to walk a fine line as a for-profit corporation bringing federal judges to speak because they have to comply with the code of conduct for United States judges. And there can be no appearance of impropriety. They can't seem to be endorsing a product. Sure. And, and frankly, I'm not going to name any names, but I think there are some vendors who push that envelope way too much. Sure. Um, for instance, if there's a federal judge on the panel and it's not Relativity Fest, it's, it's one thing for a judge to be part of Relativity Fest, but you don't want to have a judge next to a Relativity ad just like, well, here's Judge Xavier Rodriguez from Relativity. Um, so you, you got to be really careful about those things. But having said that, man, the sales professionals are the ones who keep the lights on, make sure we get paid. And um, one of our old colleagues, Sean Gaines, I think said it best. One time I was going off on my church and state pontification and Sean just looks at me and goes, yes, David, but you've got to remember the state pays for the church. <laughs> no, but but I think that's also a testament to you. I mean, I, I think if you were to go back and audit the judicial panels at RELFAST and the other times you've done panels and programs outside, like your MIT podcast and all these different things you do, you walk that line very easily. Um, or I, it may not be easy, but it appears easy. So, it's, it's because my employer let me lets me do it. Sure, sure. Uh, because I and I don't want to be unfair to anyone. I think a lot of people when they do CLEs get pressure to turn them into sales pitches. And I think a lot of those are from people who are not lawyers who don't have to take CLE. Sure. Um, because the, the last thing you want to do is and, and also, I mean, you take them because you've got a state bar requirement, but lawyers want to learn something. It's like you said, it's changing all the time. Um, I did a case recently where a judge, and it's going to be in our uh, shameless plug, the Data Discovery Year Interview ebook. Please join us if you can join us for the webinar or the ebook. But um, this judge made her ruling based on the version of Rule 26 before the 2015 amendments. And she quoted Oppenheimer funds, which is now bad law. Right. And it's that man. It, it, it's tough. And, and I suspect um, that the law clerk probably did the research on that. So it's probably the law clerk's fault. But man, you got to keep on top of this stuff. And we will try to make it as entertaining, as painless as possible. We had uh, Ariana Tadler on the, the guy. She's recently, great. The best. And we spoke about that, about how dealing with judges and keeping up with your competence, how there's a challenge of, of bad law kind of seeping into these decisions. And then what is the lawyer's role in trying to curtail that? We, we made a joke about, you know, what would it be so bad to have, you know, like the equivalent of the safety video before the airplane takes off before every every case you know the lawyers have to sit yeah. down and watch a video about cooperation but no i mean i i think it's really interesting and i also take that very seriously the way when i got into this industry back in 2008 the way i tried to become somewhat relevant was to study as much as i possibly could i basically went back to school probably read yeah. more case law and, and, and rules than i did in law school and and i always took it very seriously to keep that separate um, that's why uh, ESI Survival Guide. Um, many of you may not even know what company I work for. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the company I work for. I'm very proud to be there. Um, but at the same time, I, I think that um, it's important to keep a level of integrity when it comes to the academic content and to understand that that there's a difference between saying, "Hey, here's an amazing tool. Here's how you can use it. Here's my opinion on how great it is." And then weaving that into a discussion on application of, of law to best practices and coming across as if these tools are preferred in certain contexts, which right. you know, that's the thing you got to watch out for. But, but with that, David, I would like to jump into a quick James Lipton-esque section. All right. All right. I have my cards here. There, there, there's nothing on them, but I figured I would. And this is like a pop quiz because let our gentle viewers know I have not heard these questions in advance. So, right, right. No, so now we're not confusing this with the, the ESI 5. So the ESI 5 oh. is going to be, right. So the ESI 5 is going to be a separate section. This is more about, we're still, David, this is what's amazing. And I knew this was going to happen because because you're super interesting. And I love talking to you. <laughs> we're, we're at an hour now. 
Oh and, yeah. And, and, and we're, we're, we're halfway through section one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, David, I like to pivot to uh, my James Lipton style Q and a, I have Great. some, some cards here that they're really only for effect because there's actually nothing <laughs> on them, but a few questions just to peel back the onion on uh, David Horrigan, the man. So what three activities do you think would sum up your childhood? Dog shows, debate tournaments, and um, being a little kid in the qua choral pop group. <laughs> okay. It's some, I think there's an entire podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in there. Okay. The, 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 number two, favorite sitcom. Uh, oh, you got to go with Seinfeld. Beautiful. Perfect, perfect. Favorite board game? Be a game called Diplomacy. Sort of a world history geeky sort of game. <laughs> of course. Of risk, course. risk would be a close second. Risk, risk is good. Is Diplomacy, is that still on the shelf or is that another you dating yourself? Oh, I'm big time dating myself. I think you can still get them, but you know, you can tell you're a classic player if you get the old blocks for going around the world. Um, they've replaced them with plastic now, but you know, you know, you're an old school diplomacy player if you've got wooden blocks conquering <laughs> sure. the world. Puzzles or cards? Cards. Fantastic. What is your favorite holiday where giving gifts is not the central aspect or main part of the celebration? Hey, man. It's tomorrow. It's actually starting the moment we stop recording this podcast because you got to go with Thanksgiving. What is there not to like? Football, food, booze. Um, and a lot of times you get to see your family. I guess that can be a double-edged sword, but uh, and your <laughs> friends. And so festive holiday, um, Thanksgiving. A, a, a close second, if not equal first, would also maybe Veterans Day. We could go with that one. <laughs> yeah, that's our theme. Here's to our dads. Exactly. That was a shout out to our dads. So... If you could be the best at one thing, and it has to be something that you have almost no skill at now, what would it be? Mm. And again, these don't have to be, you know, we're not, we're not putting these into the annals of history. So uh, this just wh whatever you think comes to mind. Yeah. My, I mine guess... would be drumming. I think mine would be to be a drummer. Yeah, I, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I was vacillating between, I, I took piano lessons as a kid and my piano teacher said, if you don't practice and stick with this, when you get to be an adult, you'll be sorry. Sure enough, I'm an adult and I am sorry I didn't stick with it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, um, it, it's like what Bill Clinton would say. I'm so sorry. I just want you to know that I do feel your pain, Matt. Matt, I do. I really, really do. Hey, that's, that's, um, that's pretty good. That's thanks, a, thanks. A um, I, I, you know, I being apolitical, the only reason I really wanted Hillary Clinton to win is so that my Bill Clinton impersonation would come back into prominence. Um, but uh, yeah, it, 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 I, I, I just, I, I, I don't have a Jill Biden impersonation or a Melania mean, Trump impersonation. But the, uh, I think anybody who harkens back to earlier in our discussion where you said you're you thought your voice was high pitched, just probably, you know, laughed at my reaction. I think I just had like a little chipmunk on helium. Moment. <laughs> <laughs> been there, been there, done that. But I'll throw out another idea for the, for the skill set that you have no skills, but you could be the best at it. I also always wanted to be good at like wingsuit flying. Have you seen Pardon my ignorance. What the expletive is it? You ever, you never seen people like like it's basically skydiving, but they wear these big oh, kind of parachutes. Oh, okay, cool. And you see them flying like literally like you know feet above the ground, and just it, it looks pretty intense. But I, hey, I, Matt, I, do you do you think we should tell our gentler viewers about the construction? Oh, oh, uh, so yes, yeah, so if um, yeah, well, yeah, if you can hear that, so a uh, little bit of a disclaimer. I was hoping it wouldn't be an issue during this, but if you do hear in the background, uh, today, the owner of the apartment above me has decided to either uh, completely remodel their apartment or install concrete floors because there's a bit of a, of a jackhammer and every other power tool that I think Home Depot sells 
is going off in a, in a chorus upstairs. So uh, we'll do our best to uh, edit that down. But if that is a distraction, Matt, no, Matt, I'll tell you the only reason I mentioned it, because I knew what it was, because you and I talked about it before the broadcast, but if I didn't know, I would have assumed that was uh, Harriet and Hubert above you flushing the toilet repeatedly, because <laughs> at least in my headphones, that's what it sounded like. So gentle viewers, no, it is not the flushing of the toilet, it's merely construction and progress for the future of Matt's building in America. <laughs> right. We, 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 we hope we hope that's the reason right but so, so we're gonna go with piano yeah yeah let's go with that okay okay so do you have uh and i only ask this because i have a few three and they, and they come up often and we'll save them for another time so we don't go too long but do you have a a near death story and, and if you do have one do you have one that, that where there's some levity to it yeah it's actually it was a near tragedy but um, there was almost some, le <laughs> there's, there's some levity. Basically, we were, um, it was Christmas Eve, 1996, and we were held up by gang members. There was literally a um, gun to my head. Now you're going to say, how is this story funny? Yeah, yeah where's the levity in this story? Yeah, yeah, well, well, first of all, it's Christmas Eve. So I, the gang members are surrounding us and I, and I have the gun to my head and I've got a Santa hat on. Sometimes <laughs> I, when I was replaying yeah, this thing, I'm I was sorry, thinking, I'm sorry, I'm that's, I know, that's the only reason I'm alive because I had the Santa hat on. And it, cause I thought I was dead because my girlfriend and I are there, we're getting into the car and then there, here's the gun here. And he's like, um, the wallet, the wallet. And um, so I just take my wallet and trying to avoid looking at him. So he's not gonna blow my weenie ass away. And so I just throw the wallet, not looking at him. And he's like, the purse, the purse. And, and then I, I go to my girlfriend, Hannah, I need your purse. And she's like, deer in the headlights <laughs> you're, you're there. Like, oh, I'm like, me. I, uh, I need I, your purse. Can I, can I borrow your purse real quick? Yeah. And, and, and then she's like, I don't have it. And I'm like, um, she doesn't have it. Here, take the car and threw the keys down. And so I'm standing there. I've thrown the keys down. There's a momentary pause. And you're like a little kid at the doctor waiting to get a shot. I am waiting to hear the bullet. Bullet's going to come any minute now. And so I put my head inside the car while I'm standing out like this so that if I get shot, it won't go into my head and I might leave. And all of a sudden, there's nothing there. So we're in this parking lot and the bar is over there. And so I'm like, okay, on the count of three, we're going to run in. One, two, three Ooh, and i'm across that parking lot i get halfway across i realize she's not there i'm like oh no so i go drag her and then it's like one of these scenes so we get in there and i'm like hey we need to call the police uh just had a mugging so call the police and i had a friend there who i knew had some doobage on him and this is before it was legal so i was like you need to go flush that right now the cops are on the way and so then we're sitting there. Meanwhile, my girlfriend who wanted to go to midnight mass was reminding me if we'd gone to midnight mass, oh, this would did. not have happened. God <laughs> has put his vengeance down. You gotta throw a midnight mass in the story, of course. So then the police come, <laughs> yeah, you know, we've had some issues um, uh, with these gangs that have come over and blah, 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 blah. And so they leave, we get the police report. And so my friend comes up to me, um, he's like, hey, would you like to smoke a joint? And I'm like, I thought I told you to flush that stuff. I'm in law school. Um, he's like, you were in an emotional state. You were not thinking. Um, so it's about as humorous of a near-death experience as it could be, because everybody lived, everybody was fine. And... And, and I like how it ended with the very calm, the voice of reason. Right, it was yeah. somebody you would not think would be the voice of reason. That story is absolutely insane. Yeah, just, just for the record. For now, the record. my former girlfriend, probably to this day, does not see the humor. God bless her. Yeah, she's probably not. <laughs> yeah, about she... that. M mine was uh, I almost fell off a cliff when I was in the Boy Scouts. Very different story. Very, di very different, uh, different uh, vibe there. But no, thank you for sharing that. that sure, is, yeah, that is a highlight. If, if my whole entire blog had, could have a highlight reel that's that's going on oh, i'm glad we made it, it. cool <laughs> do you do you have a celebrity encounter story yeah you know when i was an undergrad at tulane we had um 
uh, I worked on the Speaker Symposium and we had um, President Carter and President Ford and um, it was great meeting them. I think that Jimmy Carter is one of my all time heroes. Quick story, because I know we're running hot on time. We had set up this whole thing where a Tulane um, alumnus donated a Learjet because Carter, President Ford was going to be in Atlanta. And so we were in New Orleans, Tulane, of course. So we're the, and, and not, more importantly, not only did he donate the plane, he donated the fuel. So there's going to be no cost. So we get in the plane, we fly from New Orleans to planes to pick up Jimmy Carter. Then we go to Atlanta to get Ford and we come back and we got this whole thing. Last minute secret service nixed it. They said, nope, nope, nope. Too much of a security risk. We can't do it. And you know, we're like 22 year old kids and we worked on this thing and we got the presidents and, but at least we're going to get to meet him at the airport and ride in the limousine with him. So we're at the airport and the press asking him a few questions. Then we go to get the car and, and secret service goes, Oh, by the way, you go get in your own car. You can't ride with the president. And I'm like, and, and these guys, I, 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 since then, I've practiced in Washington for years. I met many wonderful Secret Service guys. Sure. These guys were phalluses um, <laughs> because they, they had the gratuitous showing of the guns. You'd be in a meeting with them. They'd pull their jacket over just so you can see the gun. And I'm like, whatever, dudes. So now I'm pissed. And so we're there on the tarmac. And, and so I go and walk them back to my little car in the back. And, and Jimmy Carter goes, well, Dave, you're going to ride with me, aren't you? I said, who am I to say no to the former leader of the free world? I'm like, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. President. Thank you very much. And as we were walking through, I, that Secret Service agent's in the front seat. He looked at me. I just like smirked. The biggest 22-year-old jerk smirk. <laughs> you, you know how 22-year-olds are. Oh, I yeah. know about the jerk smirk. Yeah, well, jerk smirk. <laughs> This Secret Service agent got a jerk smirk. And, you know, what a pompous little kid I was. That guy could have blown me away and it would have been national security, top secret classified, and no one would have ever heard me from me again. Yeah, there, there, smart... there, you would have literally, your legacy would have been on, in, a, in, a, in a banker's box somewhere like yeah. 50 meters below the ground. Right. So, but those, With Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> exactly. Another Jimmy. Well, man, two, two awesome back to backers right there. Fantastic. What What is one band that you would like to see live solely based on the fact that their name was literal? So an example would be like the Rolling Stones, if they were actually Rolling Stones, which, by the way, played an amazing show in Atlanta recently. But really? But yep. Uh, the, 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 the Mick Jagger, is, is he is he 80? Is he he's got to be yeah something like that or something, and he's still killing it amazing but yeah so name a band that you would like to see live solely based on the fact that their name was literal mine mine was oh i've seen them live but the red hot chili peppers i think would be pretty hilarious if their name was actually literal well it, yeah, i have to admit i love gladys knight and the pips but what is a Hit. Yeah, what is what is it? Is it a real thing? Hey, you know, uh, you see me with a Houston Astros hat on, and we were talking about mission control and NASA in Houston earlier. Here's a fun fact. I just learned this on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me a, a while ago. Do you know what the Midnight Train to Georgia, famous Glad Gladys Knight and the Pip song? Do you know what its original title was? Midnight Train to Georgia? I do not. It was Midnight Plane to Houston. Okay. And because Did when the, the songwriter was very good friends with Lee Majors, uh oh, dating ourselves again. For those <laughs> of you who remember the 70s and the 80s, Lee Majors was a big time actor. He was big the $6 time. million dollar man. Yep. His wife, Farrah Fawcett Majors. Um, no, I'm telling the story wrong. I, I'm telling the story wrong. Um, but that is all true. Everything I've said is true. Um, they were together. But she, no, I've got the story right. Go with your first instinct to this standardized test. So anyway, the songwriters call it, the guy who wrote Midnight Train to Georgia, who wrote it, calls up and Farrah Fawcett answers the phone. And um, she, she says, oh, I'm sorry, he's not here. He's on the midnight plane to Houston. Oh, so, so we start writing the song. Farrah Fawcett wrote that song. Well, yeah, indeed. So time comes and he and they said, you know, we want Gladys Knight to sing this. And Gladys Knight said, um, my people don't go to Houston and they don't ride in planes. Let's make it a midnight train to Georgia. 
Midnight Train of Georgia is is, is a infinitely better title, though, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing against my former home hometown, but you know there are a lot of planes well, well, going into Houston. Yeah, well, what what would it be now? It'd be like uh, like like two a.m. electric scooter to Starbucks. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, a fixed gear bike to Williamsburg, but uh, so. Uh, Next question. Have you ever cried at a movie? Well, no, but I had two close calls. Never, never cried at a movie. Never. Not, not even like the chin thing. No, no. Well, I, maybe the chin thing getting close. One time we were at this um, ABBA uh, tribute band and my wife popped her, um, um, I want to say it was a hamstring or something. I'm not sure what it was. She was jamming to ABBA. And so she pops, she falls down, um, steps on me and like, ah, but no, I know where you're going, counselor. And it, 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 counselor, that's not what you had in mind, I know. But I, I will, I will, I will, I will admit it, I'll admit it. Your response but it was, to the question, no, it was, have you ever cried in a movie? was like, yeah, like somebody stabbed me in the leg. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I will give you one that is what you want. Who remembers from the 90s, uh, Clint Eastwood, The Bridges of Madison County? Oh, it's a great that movie. Uh, is a great movie. It's a it's sad, sad ass movie. It's a sad, it's a sad movie. Yeah. Okay. So I am. I'm with one of my law school classmates, and we're there watching it in Gainesville, Florida. And she's like sobbing, like, ah! I'm like, would you please stop? Because you're going to get me going. And so you have got this poignant scene on the bridge in Madison County, and um, you've got my law school classmate. And so I'll, I'll give you the chin, counselor. Maybe the chin, but I don't think a tear was shed. But Whew, barely made it out of that one alive. Yeah, I, I have to admit, and I, I forget if it's a DreamWorks or a Pixar movie, but I actually cried to that movie Up, the the the, the, the animated movie where the old man goes up in the balloons. Yeah, the balloons that's sad. I'm a bit of a sentimental guy, but but so okay, a couple more questions uh, before we we conclude our our segment on David Horgan, the individual. Would you rather know every language ever known to man? Or would you rather be able to speak with animals? Oh, I got to go with Dr. Doolittle. If we could <laughs> talk to the animals, learn their languages, think of all the things we could discuss. Yeah, Dr. Doolittle, rock on. Fair enough, fair enough. Stuck in an elevator overnight or stuck on a ski lift overnight? Oh, elevator. It could be um, white, nice and warm in there. I don't know if you've ever that happened to you twice. One of them, one time's in a document production, I have been stuck in elevators. With the document production, this was when I was in law school one summer years ago, we, we had like loaded it up with banker's boxes and we had overweighted it. And then another time I was in there, but apparently people freak out when they're stuck in elevators. See, that, that was my thing. My, 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 the whole concept of the question was temperature versus uh, enclosed spaces. Because at least yeah, I, the, the, of out, you know. I just hate the roller coasters. It's not so much the roller coaster going up and down is when you're on the ones where you're dangling out there and you're all out in the open, sure. not a fan. And these people, these freaks who go skydiving, <laughs> yeah, whiskey know, tango, foxtrot, what are they thinking? <laughs> or, or wingsuit flying. A wings, um, exactly. That's why I brought that up. <laughs> and my favorite um, roller coaster growing up actually was, was I can't believe I remember this. Uh, you're bringing a lot back, David. Um, the, the Big Bad Wolf at Bush Gardens in Williamsburg, Virginia. It was one of the first roller coasters where you like, you were suspended from your, your top. Yeah, so you, not your, a fan. Your legs kind of dangled, but, but okay. So two more questions and one will end in the spirit of Thanksgiving. Briefly, because I've always wondered this because you, you carry yourself like you don't have any, but we all do. How do you deal with stress? Oh God, I, I'm stressed out all the time. I mean, I've got a a six-year-old boy, a puppy, uh, a job that's pretty demanding. We were like, we when we were kids, we all went to family therapy to talk about our feelings. And it was an, an era when it was, we all talked about our feelings, but one of the greatest- Wait, you, were, you, ever, were in a, you were in a military household and you did that? That's amazing. Well, the deal is though, and this is no disrespect to my dad, if you, my dad always says, you know, he's a captain in the U.S. Navy and, and he was in the Navy for 34 years and never set foot on a ship. 
because he's in mission control and he's a scientist. So it's not as if it were the Von Trapp family in The Sound of Music where he's having um, duty stations all the time. So Captain Horrigan is, is much more of a laid back scientific type guy. Um, and my mother, God rest her soul, she was just the flower child and um, wanted you to know that. Um, Very and cool. uh, the martinis would be prepared properly. Sure. Yeah, so it's, it was a weird juxtaposition. But um, anyway, so this, this thing is, and, and it was biofeedback and it was really cool, but they, they basically attach the electrodes to your, your forehead. It, it's funny that we're talking about this because I was just telling someone recently about this. And so when you see the electrodes go up, when you see um, how much is there, and so what they're trying to do is relax your forehead. So if you find yourself stressed out, sit back and concentrate on relaxing your forehead. And I, I probably do this two or three times a week, just if you've got the time. And, and if you don't have the time, make the time because it's worth it. Yeah, Chill. Yeah. And then we're going to be redoing it at some point. Fast 2020, we did a session with Tom O'Connor, Gulf sure. Coast Legal Technology Center, Ruth Halsworth um, from Cooley, a great lawyer. Um, my cousin, Dr. Diane DeKaiser, who's a psychiatrist, and um, her boyfriend, the Honorable Tom Homer, who is a former appellate judge in Illinois and a former um, Illinois state legislature. And it's a wellness session. Tom talks about his 25 years of recovery from alcohol. Uh, my cousin talks about medical issues because she's a physician. Uh, Ruth Houseworth has gone through the UCLA mindfulness training. So we literally did a meditation. Um, and so, yeah, if you can get mindfulness tapes, I mean, they work wonders, but the real low tech, easy thing to do, just sit back and concentrate on relaxing your forehead. And if you relax your forehead, it'll like cascade all the way through. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, I love those practical tips. And, you know, we're all about survival tips here on the guide. And maybe one of the best survival tips for lawyers and legal technologists is just that. You want to avoid stress, try and relax your forehead. Uh, and mindfulness is very important. I always find, I mean, all stress is related to either thinking about the past or worrying about the future. If you can really try and be in the present, um, that can always be helpful as well. And our, our, our final question with David Horrigan, uh, the individual, what is the most recent, this is in the spirit of Thanksgiving as well, but what is the most recent act of kindness you remember that really stuck with you? You know, I guess some people might classify this as somebody just doing his or her job, but um, I, um, my little bank here at the beach got bought out recently, and I was told the ABA routing number would not change. Of course, it did. So I get this email from Relativity Payroll and saying that, you know, this happened and we have been told this is your new ABA routing number. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, blah, blah, blah. They, um, they took it upon themselves to research themselves what the ABA routing number was, got the correct one, and I got paid. I don't want to disparage any of my former employers, but I can't imagine somebody in payroll going to that much trouble. <laughs> it's like, man, you give us bad data, you'll get your paper check when we get around to it. So man, that is a wonderful act of kindness. And um, I have to go right to somebody at Relativity about that because it's one of those, it's one of those times where you say, man, I'm glad I work for this company. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and with that, David, this concludes the first segment. We're going to do four segments with, with David. Looking uh, forward the, to it. The individual, the lawyer, the orator, and the technologist. Very excited about all of that. But David, again, happy Thanksgiving. I'm very thankful for you and for you being here and everything you do in the business. I can't say how thrilled I am to have you on the guide and to continue our conversation. And thank you so much. Any, any parting words? Matt, thanks for your kind comments. And, and thank you for all you do, Matt. And years ago, you know, you know, I did that thing with Fasciola, where he gave, I thought, one of the greatest quotes of all time. The attorney client privilege has the sanctity of the medieval papacy. Um, and and Fasciola is great. And so I thought you did a great job setting up that program. And it's great working with you. And thanks for all you do. I appreciate that, David. And with that, I just want to say to all of you out there, have a great Thanksgiving. And please, from myself, from David, to all of you out there, stay safe in the electronic wilderness. Take care and see you next time. Take care.